All right, everybody, we are right at 10 a.m., so we're going to get started with the webinar. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to start off by also saying during this difficult time, I hope uh, we all hope that you and your family and friends are safe and healthy. Um, my name is Emily Knight. I am a manager with the Lundfest Ocean Program. For those of you that do not know us, the Lensfest Ocean Program is a grant-making program that funds ocean and coastal research projects and expert working groups that address needs facing decision makers and stakeholders. To learn more, visit us at lensfestocean.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter and follow us at Lensfest Ocean on Twitter. In fact, uh, with this webinar, we will be live tweeting it using the hashtag LOP webinar. Uh, so feel free to use that and engage with us there. So we have joining us today, Dr. JJ Cruzmoda from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, Dr. Tarsila Sierra from the University of New Haven, Dr. Stacy Williams from the Institute for Socio-Ecological Research, and Dr. Bill Arnold, Chair of the Caribbean Council EBSM Technical Advisory Panel. They will be discussing their new research project to inform development of a fishery ecosystem plan in the U.S. Caribbean. The goal of their work is to build conceptual and quantitative models that help characterize the Caribbean's diverse marine ecosystems from coastal coral reef assemblages to offshore blue water habitats. I will let them share the details of the project, but what excites us at Lundfest about this is how the research aims to not only pull together existing ecological and socioeconomic data, but also combine and compare that with local perspectives and expertise. This is also a little bit different for a scientific webinar. Uh, we call it a launch webinar, um, and that is, this is a webinar at the beginning of the work versus at the end when there are results. And the purpose of that is so that we can engage audiences for the science from the very beginning. So we will continue to share information about the progress of this project as it goes on for the next couple of years using a variety of avenues. I've been building a running distribution list uh, for anyone interested in continuing to follow the, pro the project and engaging with us and the research team at any time. If you would like to be on that and, and are not or are unsure if you're, if you're on it, feel free to send me my, a note. My email is up on the slide in front of you. So before I turn it over to the research team, just a few logistics. Uh, first of all, we are recording this webinar and we'll distribute the link broadly after. Uh, we have all attendees muted. With so many people on the line, this is to present, uh, prevent feedback or echoes. We will have time at the end for questions. Use the Q&A panel to type and submit your question at any point during the webinar today. We will keep track of the queue, and I will read it aloud at the end for the researchers to answer. Uh, depending on how many questions there are, we may not get to them all, but uh, we welcome folks to follow up, up with us at LENFEST or the research team. Uh, we'll provide uh, contact information, so this is certainly not, not the end. The webinar today will end at 11 a.m. Um, and our first speaker uh, is Dr. Bill Arnold. So Bill, I am going to now turn it over to you so, so you can unmute yourself. Thanks, Emily. And I would like to say good morning and thank you to all of our attendees, particularly those out to the West who are up even that much earlier than we are. Uh, but we appreciate everybody tuning in. I'm going to provide a bit of a background as to how we got to where we are with developing a fishery ecosystem plan for the U.S. Caribbean region. Then JJ and in turn, Tarsila and Stacy, and some, summed up by JJ will be a discussion of the actual 
work that they are doing with our LENFEST grant. Uh, so first I'll start with our policy statement. And I, I should say that I'm, it's not us anymore because I'm now retired from the National Marine Fisheries Service. I was a Caribbean branch chief for, for the US Caribbean. I retired in January, uh, but for some crazy reason, I can't resist staying involved. I should be playing golf, I'm sure, but here I am. Anyway, I'm not going to read the policy statement. You can see it on your screen. The bottom line is NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service is fully supportive and bought in on uh, developing ecosystem-based fishery management approaches for all of their uh, U.S. regions. And I think this is a great idea, particularly for the Caribbean region where it is so important to consider what the National Marine Fisheries Service does, which is among other things, manage fisheries, but to do this effectively in a coral reef ecosystem. And, you know, I, obviously within any ecosystem, but certainly that much more emphasized in a coral reef ecosystem is you have to take account of the ecosystem, uh, single species management, can work, but it, it doesn't work as well. And certainly as we improve our capabilities and, and, and our data collection and analytical approaches, we become more proficient and capable of applying an ecosystem-based approach. So Emily, next slide, please. Emily. Am I going to change these slides or are you? Hold on. It should have changed. Is that the first step in the now, process? Now it is. I'm you sorry. Know? Yeah. So one okay. part of the, the first step really in developing an EBFM approach, and this is, you know, overarching guidance, was that each region has developed an implementation roadmap and a document that describes that. And of course, all of these implementation plan documents are available from the National Marine Fisheries Service. In essence, uh, it's a six-step six pyramidal process, uh, and within those six steps, there are a total of roughly, and I don't know off the top of my head exactly how many, but roughly 35 roadmap action items, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about this. These roadmap action items are divided into short, medium, and long-term milestones. Uh, given funding constraints and the many things that each council is already obligated with, we're emphasizing now those short-term milestones, which essentially are things that are already underway within any individual council, and some medium-term milestones that are also underway or at least funded and ready to go. Uh, we have not yet addressed most of the medium-term milestones or any of the long-term milestones. And, and in my mind, that's sensible because uh, we need to you know, start, take baby steps and get going. And I would also point out that some regions are well along on this. Some have completed fishery ecosystem plans. Uh, some, such as the U.S. Caribbean, but certainly not only the U.S. Caribbean, are just getting started on their fishery ecosystem plans. So, okay, uh, and on the next slide, I can show you how this six-step pyramid looks and where we are with these roadmap action items. So you can see the six steps, and I've highlighted what we're really focused on now with the Caribbean Council and mostly what our talk today will pertain to. So. The first thing we need to do, or one of the key first steps, is to develop an engagement strategy. And that engagement strategy is just bringing our user groups, those key constituencies who are so important to this process, develop the mechanisms and the pathways to get them involved, not just communicate with them, but have them involved from the ground up. And that's absolutely critical. Uh, if, if we want to do ecosystem-based management, we need to do it as a team, not not any kind of top-down approach. So that's one thing we're working on. We've made great progress with our district advisory panels and our uh, the things we'll talk about with developing conceptual models. So those conceptual models are really our first big step in the EBFM slash FEP development process. And a lot of our efforts so far has been on roadmap number 1A5 uh, 
developing, as you can see, the, our organizational priority, uh, developing fishery ecosystem plans. So on the next slide, I can, I can discuss that a little further. And our, whereas we're just getting started with our formalized technical advisory panel of which I'm the chair, and that is a, a, a formal council advisory panel, prior to that, we had a planning team. And the start point of that planning team was working with the LEMFEST NOAA task, uh, fishery ecosystem plan task force. And you can see the members there to determine how we should best go about this. And I've highlighted Tim Essington because he's he came to St. Petersburg where I'm located and sat down with us to originate this along with some other folks. And we really worked together, he spent a week. It was, it was very appreciative the time and effort he invested in getting us started on this and that he continues to invest in being there for us as a good advisor. So this was our start point, was using the, the document, building effective fishery ecosystem plans and building our approach from there. So that's sort of, as I said, where we've started. And so the count, the Caribbean Fishery Management Council has taken that to heart. Uh, but we are, you know, one, one key reason why we are behind is because the council has been fully focused at the present time on developing our new island-based fishery management plans. And these were not revisions to management plans. These we are we will when we're done with this process, which not surprisingly is taking a long period of time, but we will completely discard our old species-based, you know, Caribbean-wide fishery management plans and replace them with island-specific plans. And there will be three of them, one for St. Croix, one for St. Thomas, St. John, and one for Puerto Rico. Uh, and the folks down there are very excited about this because they have long said each of us is unique in so many different ways. So we need to be managed in a, in a, in a unique manner that reflects our heritage, our cultural traditions, and also our fisheries and our resources. And so we're that these new fishery management plans account for that. So they're very place based and they really provide the foundation from which we will build an ecosystem based fishery management approach. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And now the council is shifting to developing their fishery ecosystem plans. And we've made some good progress. Uh, no, back please, Emily. So the first thing establishing these district advisory panels, that's our, a key component of our engagement strategy and gets that citizen science involved. And then we've also had the council scientific and statistical committee closely involved they participate in plan development and they are developing conceptual models. And then of course, there's a te technical advisory panel, which is charged with making recommendations to the council regarding plan development. So that's basically where we are, a key component, and Emily shifted forward on this just a little bit, but the cycle of the LENFEST cycle, and we are in Step one, obviously, where are we now? And you can see develop a conceptual model. And from that, we'll build on that. So I'm going to turn it over to JJ, and he's going to talk in depth about these steps and take it from there. So thank you, JJ. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Emily Lemphis, for giving us the opportunity to talk about this project. And to, uh, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, in this uh, five-step uh, 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 loop, all stakeholders, uh, relevant stakeholders, uh, are involved. How, however, we have identified that uh, particular sets or groups of stakeholders have a, a part main role or leading each one of these uh, steps. Um, next, Emily. So we we have identified those uh, groups of stakeholders being responsible of those uh, uh, five steps. And uh, regarding step one, where we are now, uh, we got a uh, we have defined that as a scientific process, and I'll explain why in the next slide. But uh, we were. Uh, approached and engaged by uh, Bill Arnold, who is leading all this EBMF uh, uh, effort in the Caribbean. And uh, what I mean, uh, we is uh, 
Tarsila Seara, Stacy Williams, and myself to address uh, the first step. Next. Uh, and then uh, the Lenfis project is uh, specifically about this first uh, step is addressing the three uh, components that you can see in your in the slide of the first uh, question uh, where are we now next one emily please and uh, why are we calling this a scientific process right because we can uh, establish relationship between the three elements on the left which is the part of the lenfes protocol and the three main elements of a scientific uh, process which is uh, half observations uh, they can be quantitative or qualitative uh, observations such as uh, temporal trends uh, we propose uh, explanation of why those things are happening, and then we uh, derive hypotheses from those models that then we can test uh, and make predictions uh, if the models are, are true, right? So, next, uh, Emily. Uh, based on the Lenfes protocol, this, uh, I mean, to, ad to address these three uh, steps or points uh, is done uh, through mainly uh, qualitative, what we have defined as a qualitative approach that involves the uh, stakeholder and expert uh, opinions, right? Next one, Emily, please. Uh, in here, you can see that we can establish a relationship between uh, developing a conceptual model and even doing an inventory of threats. Uh, and the second step of the scientific process no, with the proposal of, of, of models. Whereas the second step on select and calculate indicators in the Lenfes approach can be related to the observation step in the scientific process. Next one, Emily. But then that's uh, left the point of uh, the develop, deriving hypotheses from those models. And then to fill this gap, this particular project, uh, is also using a quantitative approach to test a hypothesis derived from the conceptual models that we will uh, talk about them uh, in the next few slides. And this is uh, one important thing that is new on this uh, particular uh, project that we are uh, leading, right? Taking into consideration this, next one, Emily. The three main objectives of these uh, projects are one, to develop both a conceptual and a quantitative model of Caribbean ecosystem within a fisheries context. What this means is the fisheries will be the main node in all the uh, uh, models that we will be developing. Second, to select and estimate indicators of the performance of the model. And this second objective will be achieved qualitatively and quantitatively. And third, we will integrate the results from uh, both models, the quantitative and the qualitative. Next one, Emily, please. So you can figure it out that this, uh, at this stage, that this uh, uh, project has two main columns a qualitative column and a quantitative column. Each one of those columns got four steps and those four steps are uh, interrelated. The idea at the end of this uh, pre presentation is um, I'm gonna uh, talk about what we're gonna do with, with, with these two columns, but the intention is basically one to uh, assess the conceptual models developed by the different stakeholders and second do a gap analysis to then concentrate research uh, on those uh, gaps but for the time being i'm gonna let um, tarsila seara to talk about the qualitative approach thank you tarsila thanks jj Hello, everybody. Um, so as Bill and JJ mentioned, uh, for the qualitative approach here, we're focusing mostly on the use of conceptual models. So Emily, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so these conceptual models are being built by stakeholders, groups of stakeholders, and as Bill stressed, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, aspect of this because that ensures that the process is informed by stakeholders and that that stakeholder input is being uh, considered from the very beginning and in every step of this process. So uh, we're using here for the con for, to build these conceptual models a method that's called fuzzy cognitive map approach. Uh, and I'm just going to give a very brief explanation of how we construct these models just for those who may not necessarily be familiar with this uh, method. So uh, during these stakeholder meetings, um, we uh, uh, build these conceptual models by having stakeholders identify key components of the ecosystem uh, first. So we have a very simplified example here in the, uh, the corner of the slide. Um, just to illustrate what I mean by that. So uh, in, in this case here, in the simplified example, for instance, key elements of the ecosystem would be coral reefs, fish, fishers' income. Um, and we also ask uh, stakeholders to then identify what are some aspects and what are some elements of, these, uh, of the ecosystem that are impacting these key elements that they have identified as important elements or priority for, uh, for them. Um, so in this case here, we can see we have pollution, we have regulations. And so we ask stakeholders to then identify how are these things linked? So what are the linkages and the relationships between these different elements? Um, so in other words, how are they related to each other? What impacts what? Um, and whether the relationship is positive or negative. And we also have um, uh, uh, the strengths of the relationship scored. So, in this is they're scored in a qualitative sense. So, they're essentially scored as weak, medium, or strong relationships, and that's represented by the numbers uh, one, two, three. And as I said, they could be positive or negative. So, what we end up is with this visual representation of how stakeholders understand this ecosystem and, and, and the elements within this ecosystem and how they're related to, to each other. And this is a conceptual process, as the name suggests. And so, this is based on views, experience, and expertise. Uh, this is not a quantitative or data driven uh, uh, approach. Um, so, right now, there are ongoing efforts by the Council, as Bill mentioned, to construct stakeholder driven conceptual models. So, the SSC um, and the, the, the DAPs are, are working on uh, constructing these conceptual models, and there are also other efforts by the Council to involve uh, other stakeholders in this process as well. Um, so we will be able to use those uh, uh, conceptual models that are being uh, built by this, the, the council efforts in our analysis, um, but we'll also be developing further models as part of this particular project. So one of the things that we're going to do is run uh, stakeholder workshops uh, where we were going to go through the process that I just described and, and build uh, more of these conceptual models. And this is going to happen in Puerto Rico and also um, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and um, the idea of running these workshops and constructing these further models is that we can maximize the scope of stakeholders, and, and particularly we're going to focus on the fishers. Um, and the idea here is that we are going to end up with final models that are representative of the the, the of, of stakeholders. Um, we can go to the I think one click, Emily. We're also going to uh, use questionnaires to obtain some important information during these stakeholder workshops. These questionnaires will help us characterize uh, the participants, the sample, um, so we can um, uh, essentially characterize our sample, but also we plan to use questionnaires to potentially investigate some of these um, relationships, obtain more information that will help us contextualize some of the information that we get here. We're going to learn a lot from these stakeholder workshops, um, and that uh, uh, one of the, the 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 things that we're planning to do is then explore some of these um, outcomes a little bit more in the form of questionnaires with stakeholders. Uh, next. All right, so here's an example. So this is an actual conceptual model that was built by uh, the St. Croix DAP. And uh, this is, I don't expect you to be able to read what's in the boxes, it's just to give you a visual representation of what one of these things look like. Um, so we will end up after 
we get all the models from the council's efforts and the ones that we uh, do during the workshops, we're going to have multiple of these models. Um, so these can obviously get pretty complex. Um, so we'll have all this information uh, and we're going to be able to build a matrix with all this information, all the relationships between elements and, and we'll be able to identify key elements. Uh, and one of the, the things that's really interesting about this, I mean, each one of these conceptual models on their own are really important to provide us with information about how stakeholders understand the ecosystem. But one of the things that we'll be able to do is to combine and overlap these models um, into what we call social cognitive models. Uh, Emily, you can go to the next one, please. So uh, here, just for illustrative purposes, we have you know just these two figures here representing two separate models. Um, and as you can see, there are variables that are the same. So they're being represented here by the blue squares and we have uh, some variables that are not the same in, the, in, in those two uh, uh, models. So, Emily, one click, please. So, one of the things that we're going to be able to do with, the, with this using this, this matrix and all the information that we'll have for these relationships is to actually combine these models into the social cognitive map. So we will have one large model that includes all the different variables that were identified by the different stakeholders. And this will help us to identify what are key variables, what are key elements that are being uh, uh, repeated into these models. We can quantify how many times these uh, key elements are, are, are uh, are shown in these different conceptual models. Um, and one of the ways that we can do this is by averaging all this, the relationships. And so we can have something that will be in the end uh, a consensus model between stakeholders. And this will be really important for us to identify those key elements um, and also to uh, identify priorities and risk elements um, as part of this process. Um, so, how are we going to use this? We can go to the next slide. So, in the context of this, this project, but also broadly in the context of ecosystem-based management in the U.S. Caribbean, we're going to use uh, these conceptual models in a number of different ways. Um, so, first, the, they, you know, as uh, I mentioned, they will allow us to visualize um, these stakeholders, the, the, you know, how stakeholders perceive this uh, ecosystem, which is a very important step on its own. Uh, but having uh, uh, gone through the, the, this, uh, the, the steps of, of, of creating these um, and combining these conceptual models, we'll also be able to do some more in-depth analysis. So, for instance, we can use graph theoretical approach uh, or graph theory analysis um, to really analyze the nature and complexity of the connections. Again, this will help us identify those key variables. Um, so this will, will allow us to do some more, uh, uh, you know, just some more sophisticated analysis and how these relationships, uh, the nature of these relationships. Uh, we'll also, as I mentioned, um, be able to identify priorities and risk factors um, that will help guide man management decisions. Uh, also, within this context, it will be uh, important that we'll be able to identify elements that perhaps fall outside of the, the scope of the council and that can help um, you know, increase collaboration with other agencies. Um, and we'll also be able to uh, identify some data gaps, as JJ mentioned, that's a very important uh, uh, step here in the, or uh, aspect here of the process uh, where we can identify areas that are important, relationships that are important for stakeholders, but that we may not have data or enough data to test relationships. And this will highlight areas where uh, you know, that could guide future research. Uh, and uh, finally, and very important in the context of this particular project, uh, this whole process is going to guide the development of hypotheses that we'll be able to test using the quantitative approach. And um, Stacy is going to give us a detailed uh, account for how we're going to go about doing that next. So I'm gonna pass the ball to you, Stacy. Thank you, Tarsila, and good morning, everyone. So as Tarsila mentioned, from these conceptual models, we will be able to formulate specific hypotheses, um, which we can then run in the quantitative model. The data sources that we will test in the quantitative model include, um, Emily, next slide, please. 
So these data sources include fishery independent data. Uh, these are scientific surveys, and these particular surveys recorded fish, fish rich, richness, biomass, and abundance. Um, and some of these surveys also included benthic assessments. So uh, some of these examples of fishery independent data that we'll be using from um, come from monitoring programs such as the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, NCRIM, um, Puerto Rico and USVI um, each have their own coral reef monitoring program. Uh, we also will be using CMAP data and CREST data. Uh, we have, we will be using fishery dependent surveys and these are landing or catch data, uh, which provide, which is provided by an observer or a fisher. And we're in the process of getting this landing data from the agencies and programs below, which include fisheries lab um, from the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources of Puerto Rico, uh, the USVI Department of Planning and Natural Resources, uh, Southeast Fisheries Science Center, and TRIP Interview Program, which is the TIP program. Uh, we will also be using environmental and anthropogenic data. We're working closely with Dr. Eliana Tolet. Uh, she's an independent contractor and also an expert in understanding the variability of seascapes. And she is now in the process of extracting uh, this data. So far, we have 21 variables. And some of these variables, variables include oceanographic features like currents and wave exposures, uh, disturbances like hurricanes and sea surface temperature anomalies, larval connectivity, habitat features such as habitat heterogeneity or habitat type, and anthropogenic uh, data. Uh, this could include distance from port or human population, which are both could be used as drivers of ecological conditions. And lastly, we'll be using socio socioeconomic data. And the data sources, the data sets that we will be using for this will be the community social vulnerability indices, and these integrate the fishery engagement and reliance indices and social vulnerabilities indices. We also be collecting post uh, disturbance assessments um, carried out by Juan Agar and coral reef dependency assessments um, by Matt Gorstein and, and his team. Also, we, we will be using the fishery census data um, for both uh, Puerto Rico and the USVI. Um, so next slide, Emily. So I would like to show you a map of the different, um, different data points for the fishery independent surveys, I mean, because this will give you an idea of the spatial extent and some of the limitations of this data. Um, so both fish and benthic assessments were conducted at these sites in 2014 for the NCRIM program um, around Puerto Rico. Next, Emily. And then you can see that more sites were added in 2016. Um, next. And then in the USBI's, NCRIM was performed in 2013 um, in St. Thomas and St. John. Uh, next. And then in 2015, you can see that more data points were added uh, to both uh, using both fish and um, carrying, uh, collecting both fish and, and benthic data. Next. Again, more sites in 2017. Next. And then, as I mentioned, uh, USVI and Puerto Rico both have their own coral reef monitoring program, and these are permanent stations, and you can see that they're scattered throughout the USVIs, um, and they've been surveyed from 2005 to 2010. Uh, next. And we have the same uh, type of monitoring program in Puerto Rico. Uh, presently, we have 42 stations that we survey biannually, um, and these some of these stations have been surveyed since 1999, all the way up to more recent, 2018, uh, 2019, next. And then we will, all be, we will also be collecting CMAP. Uh, we, are, we have collected CMAP data, um, and these are fish assessments that have been carried out from 1999 to uh, 2018, next. Okay, next. So as you can see, there are a lot of data points, and we hope to obtain, oh, can you go back one, please? Thank you. Um, so as you can see that there are a lot of data points um, and we hope to obtain more. Um, however, from this map, you can see that there are some areas with more data points than others. For example, in the north coast of Puerto Rico, you could see that there's some data lacking. So there are some limitations um, 
of our study because we are constrained by these data, data sets for quantitative analyses. However, from these quantitative analyses, we will measure and understand the spatial and temporal trends of these data sources, um, examine the correlations between these sources, and identify the main drivers of the system. And JJ will go over how these different data sources will be examined and correlated. But I would like to give you an example of how we could use um, some of this environmental and socioeconomic data in our analysis. Um, so let's just say that the stakeholders thought that the turbidity was an indicator driving the fish assemblages or trophic structure in the US Caribbean. Uh, we would then quantitatively describe the temporal and spatial trends in turbidity. So next, please, Emily. So from uh, for turbidity, we can derive K490 from satellite imagery. And this is um, K490 is a diffuse coefficient at the wavelength 490 nan nanometers. And this is widely used as a proxy to indicate turbidity in the water column. Um, and if we look at this map, you can see that all the fishery independent data has a K490 value. So the green and blue represent water that are oh, that, that is clear. And then when you get to the orange and red, that's uh, where you get the turbid water. Uh, so spatially, you can see that there's some patterns in turbidity between the areas in the US Caribbean, especially between islands. Uh, you can see that uh, in the USVI, um, generally the water is pretty clear. And then when we get to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico archipelago, you can see that uh, there's uh, West Coast is, the West Coast of Puerto Rico uh, is more turbid and that is because there's major rivers discharging on the west coast um, compared to some of the, the other sites along the east coast. And you can see that the turbidity uh, goes down once you get offshore. So we can test uh, if the spatial variability could be correlated with a trophic structure of fish. Uh, next. So just like the environmental and anthropogenic data, each of the fishery independent data points will have a socioeconomic value associated associated with it. Um, so let's say the stakeholders felt that the socioeconomic factors like well-being or percent employment were variables driving the fishery system in the US Caribbean. Uh, if this was the case, we would then examine patterns in the socioeconomic data. Uh, we are still working on organizing this. So I didn't have a map like the K490, but here's a brief example of how the community social vulnerability indices can vary between the two cities. Um, between two cities in Puerto Rico. Uh, so here's the aerial view of San Juan. This is the capital of Puerto Rico, where close to 400,000 people live in city limits. And you can see in the radar chart, um, this shows you the community social vulnerability indices, uh, which integrate poverty, like the percent receiving monetary assistance, um, population composition, which could account for percent minorities, female headed households, disruption, which accounts for personal unemployment or personal uh, percent, uh, sorry, percent unemployment or percent poverty. Um, and you can see in San Juan that uh, personal disruption and poverty is pretty low compared to the other municipalities in Puerto Rico. Next. If we compare this to a city uh, south of Puerto Rico and the south coast of uh, along the south coast of Puerto Rico, Salinas, uh, has a population of about 31,000. Uh, next. You can see that the personal disruption, uh, which it's right to the right of San Juan, the personal disruption and poverty is much greater than that in San Juan. So with these patterns, uh, we hope to quantify the differences and see if they align with the stakeholders' perceptions. So next. So the quantitative model that we will that will be developed um, based on these characteristics of the spatial and temporal analysis, um, uh, we will develop this model. And JJ will go further into this in the next couple of slides. So thank you, JJ. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is just give you a brief example of how we're going to go about with items two, three, and four on the column for the quantitative uh, approach. And the first one is uh, analysis on temporal trends. Next one, Emily, please. And for that, I'm going to use a very small example, which is only one station out of the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program. And that station got sampled several years between 99 and 2019. Next one, Emily. 
And every time uh, we visit that specific uh, site, we had estimations of uh, biomass and abundance of the uh, fish assemblage in general to 247 species. And also of the benthic uh, habitat, a uh, percentage cover of different uh, benthic species, um, mainly corals. And uh, I want to uh, highlight here that by nature, this data is a multivariate or multi specific. Uh, next one, Emily. With that uh, data, we can illustrate uh, patterns of uh, temporal uh, variation. In this map, you are seeing in that uh, in your in the slide, what we have each uh, blue points represent the structure and composition of the entire assemblage, right? And then we can see with the uh, black line how that uh, full assemblage is uh, changing uh, through time. No, so the first thing we can do is quantify whether those changes vary with site or island or location. Remember here is only one site, Cayo Coral. The next thing we will be able to do with this type of analysis, next one, Emily, please, is to identify what species are associated to those uh, trends. And then, for example, in here, I only use the uh, soup assemblage that is managed in the, in the region. That subassemblage is about 80, 80 something species. And then you can see that the species on the right of your screen are decreasing through time, whereas those species on your left are increasing uh, through time. Uh, furthermore, we can go back and look at what the stakeholders uh, said during the qualitative uh, process, and we can pull out the indicators, what they identify as indicators, main indicators for the uh, uh, fishing assembl uh, fish assemblages in the region. Next one, Emily. And then and another one, please. What you have on the right is just a brief example of the type of indicators that different stakeholders have mentioned through this process, right? Then we can take those, right? Estimate those out of the data we got. Next one, Emily, please. And then relate it to that temporal trend, right? So from this exercise, we know now that total biome, for example, total biomass, diversity, naiveness, don't have much of an influence on that temporal trend as the diversity and biomass of herbivores, also the biomass of thought predators, right? So this is an example of how we can start uh, evaluating those, uh, whether those uh, uh, indicators uh, proposed by the stakeholders are actually uh, having an influence on the actual data we got. Uh, uh, Please note that these indicators in this case came from the same database, but we can use indicators from the habitat. We can use indicators from the environmental data or, or indicators from the socioeconomic data, right? And related to these uh, temporal trends on the uh, fish assemblages. Next one, Emily, please. So here is, uh, is basically what I just uh, showed you before, the fish assemblage. Next one, Emily. And the, what we have on the right is the same exercise, however, done on the environmental variable matrix. This is a hypothetical result because the data, we're still uh, getting that data. But we, what we, uh, what we wanna show with this slide is that we can actually also describe the temporal patterns in a multidimensional, multivariate space of uh, the environmental variables. Um, next one, Emily. And most importantly, we can relate those two patterns. Next one, Emily. However, our problem is a little, a little bit more complex than just relating two 
two matrices because we actually at least we got five boxes as Stacy you uh, showed. And uh, next one, Emily, please. Uh, we have multiple uh, relationships between those uh, uh, those boxes. So to solve these, uh, next one, please. We're proposing to use a family of uh, tools, analytical tools called structural equation modeling, in which the different boxes are here represented by environment, human impacts and distance are influences the species dissimilarity. In this case, this particular exercise was done with coral reefs. Um, how those boxes are influencing the uh, coral reef um, uh, the assemblages of the coral reef. Uh, in our exercise, the main node will be the fishery systems of the uh, region. Please also note that in this exercise, we can not only uh, relate the main boxes, but we can also relate individual uh, variables within each one of those boxes. This example uh, I'm showing you was done about seven years ago using mostly lineal models, but today, as per 2020, we have other non-lineal uh, uh, ways of relating uh, these uh, uh, boxes that could be more appropriate for the type of data we got. Finally, next one, uh, Emily. We are going to compare the conceptual model on your left with the quantitative model on your right. And uh, this is uh, taken from a, a paper published uh, many years ago. In this case, uh, the conceptual model and the quantitative model got exactly the same number of nodes, but that might not be the case in uh, the Caribbean. Uh, we are um, predicting that the conceptual model will have more uh, circles in this case than the quantitative model. And that difference will allow us to identify gaps uh, where uh, research will be or monitoring efforts uh, will be needed. The second thing about this comparison is that uh, those lines that were proposed by the stakeholders on your left, we will be able to put a, a magnitude to that relationship that will give uh, uh, better information uh, to the managers to uh, make decisions. Having said that, I will uh, finally, next one, Emily, please. Leave you with uh, some final considerations. And the first and most important is that the council, uh, the Caribbean Fisheries Council is mo moving forward to build an FEP this uh, movement is based on the construction of uh, conceptual uh, models. In this particular project, we are uh, including a quantitative approach that will, will allow us to, one, produce a stack conceptual model, produce the quantitative model, the comparison between one and two then will allow us to do the gap analysis, to direct research, and four, test the stack conceptual model. And very importantly, this uh, is not an a individual effort in the region. This is part of a collaborative effort uh, with other projects, such as the ecosystem status report for the Caribbean that is being currently being done by the uh, by NOAA. Ne uh, next slide, Emily. Uh, thank you very much and uh, for your attention and we will be very happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much, uh, JJ and, and Bill and Tarsila and Stacy. That was really, really interesting. Folks, we have uh, about 10, a little over 10 minutes for questions. To submit a question, please enter it into the Q&A panel. Uh, that is the best place. I am trying to check the chat, but I am also sharing my screen. So the best place for me to see it is within the Q&A, and I will read it out loud. 
Um, so we already have uh, a couple of questions, and so I'll start off. Uh, we have this first question. EBFM and the development of FEPs is important and welcome. However, the fishery is an integral part of a larger ecosystem that is about a great deal more than fisheries. Isn't EBFM an oxymoron? Shouldn't we be doing EBM for maximum benefit to fisheries? Emily, it's Bill. I'll take that one. We certainly want to achieve as much as we can. There are a lot of limitations, budgetary, data-wise, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that limit what we can do. And as I said at the very beginning of this thing, we're kind of taking baby steps. So I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying one thing at a time. And I would point out that we're taking a hierarchical approach. We've got multiple levels of consideration as as focused as the individual island and and certainly we've discussed discussed within Puerto Rico of ease, even working within sub components of the island we may have to do that because as as Stacy showed the data are not evenly distributed they're they're certainly biased both temporally and spatially and we have to take that into account but then we've got our uh, moving up the hierarchy we've got the island level and then we've got the U.S. Caribbean region level, and then we've got the basin level, you know, things like spiny lobster and a lot of these organisms, they're sharing recruits amongst the entire basin and, in, and certainly using lobster as an excellent example, uh, recruitment to Puerto Rico probably has very little to do with the adult population in Puerto Rico, and that extends throughout the basin. And then really, in, in some regards, you've got to consider it at the global level, because what happens in one area of the globe will affect another area. For example, if you deter, if you reduce take in the Caribbean, re reduce local protein uh, provision, you're gonna have to replace that protein. You're not gonna get rid of people, so you're gonna still have to feed them the protein, and that's going to have an impact somewhere else where you're growing more corn to make more pigs or whatever it may be. So we are cognizant of the complexity of this and the ecosystem-based management component of this, and we're certainly taking that into account, even with our conceptual models, but for the council specifically that we respond to and that we're beholden to, they are a fishery management council, and that has to remain our top priority. Great. Thanks for that answer, Bill. And, you know, as others of the research team, if you want to jump in and, and add anything, please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, I have a question here over, that came over the chat earlier in the during the presentation. Who decides who is a key stakeholder? I'll take that one too, Emily. That is a kind of a mutual approach. Uh, and keep, keep in mind, this is the U.S. Caribbean region. This is not the Mid-Atlantic region. It is a culturally diverse and in some ways a separate group of cultures that we have to be responsible to and sensitive to. So the first thing that the council did, of course, the council is diverse itself, representatives from all the islands, is they established these district advisory panels, which consist of each panel consists of 15 people from the island that span the, the spectrum of what we would recognize as, as key interest groups, wreck fishing, commercial fishing, uh, dive groups, uh, agencies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we are seeking input and constantly seek input from all interested parties, whether they be from San Juan or uh, Christiansted or, or Des Moines, Iowa, or wherever, or somewhere else in the globe. Everybody has an interest in the health of coral reef ecosystems, Caribbean and otherwise. So uh, we are, our ears and eyes are open to all valid and constructive input. Great, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, so we have a, a, a question here. Uh, in the model that JJ described, uh, is the watershed and island economy as a whole embedded in the environmental anthro or anthropogenic box? Uh, 
Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, Stacy, would you like to address that? It's because it's a type is related to the type of data we got. Yeah, so the so the island economy um, will be integrated in the socioeconomic data. A lot of the anthropogenic data and socioeconomic data somewhat overlap. So yeah, this that will be also included into the analysis. Um, the watershed does a watershed um, embedded um, and they, maybe go more into that question. I'm not sure what is uh, like land use will be. Well, we're all we're we're looking at land uses. If, well. The environmental data, such as like turbidity and um, productivity, but land use per se, um, I, we at at the current don't have that involved in our in our analyses. Stacy, sure. I'll, I'll touch on that a little too. We had a scientific and statistical committee meeting last week, and during that meeting, the riverine inputs were discussed and uh, certainly it's a consideration and the scientific and statistical committee, the SSC is thinking about that and will present it to the council. I anticipate when they report to the council, after all the decision-making bodies, the council, not us, we're advisory groups. But uh, you have to keep in mind that while we have a lot of data and this isn't to, to, to diss the, the question of the approach, but when we have a lot of data, matching these highly resolved temporal and spatial uh, outputs from the rivers with much less resolved data on fisheries and ecosystems it can be difficult at times but certainly we are you know that discussion has been brought up and is being considered and i hope that helps answer the question yeah thanks yeah. thanks for that bill and and Les, if you want to send a chat or anything, if there's something specific you were looking for there, or send an email after, we're obviously always happy for more conversation. Um, this isn't a question, just a note that I'll, I'll read out to folks, which uh, is that um, the head of NOAA NOS OCM is on the line and will be doing a coral ecosystem services evaluation project starting next year possibly using your socioeconomic data. So thank you for that comment. Um, it's always good to see what other uh, at, uh, projects and initiatives are going on that um, are using this data or we can connect to. Uh, we have another question here. Um, when will the workshops begin? What are you guys thinking about timing around, uh, I'm assuming these are the stakeholder workshops? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, yeah, this is a great question because we initially had it planned to start the summer, but for obvious reasons, we had to change our plans slightly, but we are uh, having conversations within the team and also with LenFest um, to try to get those running as soon as we can, given the circumstances with the pandemic. Um, so we don't have a date yet when we will be able to do it, but um, uh, you know, as soon as we do, we'll be happy to share that information. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, just a comment noting that all the regions are diverse, but I wanna jump to the next question because we just have a couple minutes here. Uh, great presentation. Do changes in time of the fish assemblages uh, get related, uh, will they be related to predator-prey interactions? Changes from a benthic-dominated to a pelagic-dominated system due to environmental changes or fishing effort dictates the fish assemblages and, and how they are changing? Uh, but definitely all those uh, those uh, potential uh, drivers of fish assemblages will be uh, evaluated. First one, prey predator relationships will be inherently uh, tested in those uh, I mean I showed a graphical representation of how that um, relationship between individual fish species and uh, 
the temporal trend will be related, right? But there are uh, actual statistical models uh, uh, behind those uh, graphical representations. So inherently, when we're correlating individual fish species to the temporal trend, in that process, we are putting one of those species is the prey and the other species is the uh, another, another uh, sorry. Some of those lines are the prey and one line will be the predator. And then we will be able to test for potential uh, correlations between uh, those uh, two elements into uh, and how much of that influenced the, the temporal trend. That's one. Uh, Emily, th there were two others. Could you please remind me? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dre. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, the first one was prey after prey. The second one was? Yeah, benthic dominated to pelagic dominated. We haven't considered that yet. However, it could be easily done, and thank you very much, because then, then this add uh, uh, another dimension that we, I haven't heard on, at least in the SSE, for example. But that's very interesting and can be uh, easily incorporated, because then we develop, we estimate uh, doses, I mean, how much uh, a system is, uh, is dominated by benthic uh, uh, species versus uh, uh, versus uh, pelagic species, right? And then we can have those indicators and those indicators can be correlated to that trend. And the third one, Emily? Yeah, sure. It was uh, when fishing effort dictates the fish assemblages and, and associated changes. Ah, uh, no, definitely. And that will be the main, the, the main two boxes that will be, we will be correlating. The fishing effort, which is a box that has, uh, 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 I believe uh, 11 or 12 ta variables versus the box of the fish assemblages. Definitely, that will be definitely done. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And we're gonna end um, on this next question because we're right at 11.02. So this is our, our last one, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, aside from fisheries managers, uh, what types of, of other, if any, policymakers will be part of the stakeholder group? I'll take that one, Emily. It's Phil, and we actually are working very hard, and it's not a simple process, not as simple as I think it should be, to get other agencies involved, including federal agencies and local agencies. And it's not a uh, criticism of them. They're very busy with what they do, but we are looking to, for example, uh, the each island's management agencies, not fishery management, but, you know, resource management agencies to build their own conceptual models. That's part of the build and then stack process. Uh, we would like to have, you know, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we would like to have the uh, EPA, involved and we know that that right now we're operating at two key levels one level is the fisheries level and one level is the ecosystem the coral reef ecosystem level that goes way beyond fisheries and includes all of those other key uh, management groups that are managing water flow and uh, building patterns etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're trying i mean this is a big job and we've got a lot to do as i said at the beginning we're really just getting started, but we appreciate these kinds of inputs and we're we're trying to maintain an open mind as to how we can improve what we're doing to maximize our likelihood of success. Great, thank you so much, Bill. And thank you to the whole research team, JJ, Tarsula, Stacy, uh, and thank you all of you who are able to join us. We're at the end now and really appreciate uh, you you joining the webinar and engaging in the discussion. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, uh, end this. So thank you all very much for joining us. Bye-bye.